Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Daily Lines Press Box. Uh, this is Don Vincent. I am the owner and publisher of the Daily Line. Um, thank you for joining us today. We're going to give our attendees a minute or so to join the call here. Um, so just please be patient with us as we give it a minute to uh, allow everybody to enter those passwords and uh, get logged on. Um, we are going to be talking today about the general election coming up here next Tuesday, November 8th. Um, we got some key races that we will be highlighting. Um, with us today is Ben Zielinski and Patrick Finkston with the Illinois. They're going to be breaking down a couple of races here for us in just a few moments. So just bear with us another moment or two and we will we will get started. In the meantime, uh, know that there is a chat window. Um, so if you uh, see on your screen now, I will be typing a quick note. Feel free to drop any questions or comments in the chat window. Oh, everybody. Um, if you have any questions or topics that as we discuss, we will try to get to any questions that come up um, in tune with what we're talking about, but we are saving a few minutes for the end of the call for a quick Q&A. So um, hope, uh, hope you all can stay with us for the hour, um, but we will uh, get started here in just a quick moment. Great to see uh, Chris. And Jason, thank you all for joining us today. Tom, good to see you. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started, guys. Um, today, well, we're going to be breaking down the um, a couple of races. The main uh, the main ones are going to be the governor, the secretary of the S secretary of state, uh, two Illinois Supreme Court case um, uh, races, the attorney general's race, the workers' right amendment, Amendment One some key races in the House of Representatives and the Senate. Um, then we'll give some time for Q&A and then any final thoughts from uh, Ben and Patrick. So again, my name is Don Vincent. I am the publisher and owner of the Daily Line. Um, with us is um, my legislative reporter, Ben Zielinski, and um, from the Illinois, Patrick Fingston. Welcome to the call, guys. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Don. Welcome. Well. There is no doubt uh, been a lot of talk about the the governor's race. Um, let's see here, let me get to the next slide. Uh, we have J.B. Pritzker, Darren Bailey, and Libertarian candidate uh, Scott Schulter. Um, some general thoughts. Where are we at on this race, Ben? It seems like it's going to go for Pritzker. Um, somewhat of a given in Illinois, he's not exactly an unpopular governor. Um, the polling shows that he's up ahead. The last poll from WGN and Emerson College last week showed he was up by nine points, which is um, a, which does show a tighter race than it was uh, about a month before that, at the end of September. Um, so Darren's trying to make it competitive. He's doing what he can. Uh, really, the big thing we've seen in this race that I think is obvious to everybody is just how much money J.B. Pritzker has to spend on this race, that he saturated the airwaves with his message and He's had ads on TVs literally since the day the primary ended, um, and he's really used that to you know, paint this difference between what his record is and show who Darren Bailey is, as the governor always says. Um, so a lot of this race, I think, uh, in some ways, you know, it comes down to a lot of the stuff we see nationally in the politics and the climate of you know, our political discourse these days. Um, you know, Darren does embody that right wing side, the angry folks on the right who are upset about the pandemic mitigations. That's how Darren became popular. Um, Governor Prisker is obviously the total opposite of that because he was the one who put in those mitigations and he became unpopular among a lot of people for that. Other people believe it was the right move, um, but then his record also just shows that he's been able to um, bring us some sort of fiscal responsibility with a couple budget surpluses, depending on how you view how we got those surpluses. Um, but you know it, there's two different records to run on here um and i think at the end of the day it does swing certainly in Pritzker's favor I, I think it's safe to say that that the race is closing uh it, it you know on my poll in late august had it at 20 and then uh, as ben mentioned the wgn poll has it at nine the environment is is shrinking down for republicans uh you know in a place like illinois where it's closing gaps the question is, are there enough undecideds left for 
uh, for Bailey to close a gap that large. And I don't know that there is. Um, it, it will probably end up being like a six to 10 point race instead of a 17 to 20 point race, which we were maybe expecting in, in July, which, you know, obviously is, is no consolation to, to Bailey or his supporters, but that could have huge ramifications down the ticket as well. Absolutely. We know that Bailey's got a number of votes that he's going to have to pick up in order to make this a competitive race. Where do you see those those votes coming from? Where where are we going to where is he going to be able to pick up those big numbers? Well, what I'm telling what I'm telling people is just watch DuPage County. Uh, That's that's going to be the barometer of what happens uh, in statewide, because in in 2014, Bruce and I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but Bruce Rauner uh, buried Pat Quinn in DuPage County. Uh, and the, and that was one of the keys to his victory in 2018. You know, and, and of course, DuPage has this long history and track record of being a uh, a Republican uh, stronghold, uh, but has definitely uh, trended more Democratic in the last decade or so with all of the um, urban departures into the suburbs and and as it's gotten more diverse. Uh, in 2018, J.B. Pritzker won DuPage County huge. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying Bailey has to win DuPage County to win the election, but uh, if he if he is within a point or two, uh, that that makes the gap he has to close with a shrinking down state electorate uh, a little less uh, of a of a hill to climb. Uh, ben, what what topics? Um, are voters going to the polls with that are potentially going to close uh, close that gap? That's a great question, and some of that answer depends on who you ask. Now, WGN's most recent poll and several national polls have also showed this as well, that the number one issue for voters is the economy and inflation. Um, yeah, in some ways, it doesn't feel like we've heard a lot about the economy and inflation in this race specifically for governor. Um, Darren brings it up sometimes, you know, talking about gas prices and the extra costs everybody faces now. The governor doesn't talk about it a lot, but when you ask him about it, he'll start talking about what Democrats did earlier this year to provide $1.8 billion of temporary tax relief. Inflation hasn't really eased a lot over the last few months, um, so it's clearly still an issue at the front of voters' mind. But these two candidates, the governor has spent virtually the majority of his campaign campaigning on abortion since the end of June when Roe v. Wade was overturned. Um, He and Democrats really feel like this is an issue that's mobilizing voters. It's going to mobilize women, and that's key for a victory for them. Darren, on the other hand, as you've obviously seen, has focused a lot on crime, specifically on the Safety Act. He wants to get rid of the whole thing. Um, you know, he at one point in the summer, he tried this kind of South Side tour, going to different scenes of shootings, talking about how the Safety Act is already making us more unsafe and is emboldening criminals. Um, that's a whole nother rabbit hole to how the Safety Act has impacted this election. But Darren really thinks that crime is going to be a big factor for voters, even though the polling shows it's, at least here in Illinois, shows it's really only a concern for about nine to 10 percent of voters. Um, So one time I did ask Darren about that, and he said, um, you know, if you don't have safety, you don't have anything else. It makes it hard to have a strong economy, makes it hard to keep people in Illinois. And that's why he feels like running on this message of crime is going to be more effective than even talking about the economy, which is obviously a liability for the Democrats, just given they're the party in the White House and in Congress. Yeah, and I think that the abortion question, you know, I don't know that we're going to have an answer until election night, obviously. But, uh, you know, if you look at at the polling like like WGN that showed abortion number one, you know, that's poll, that's a poll of the the entire electorate. So that's that's Democrats, of course, who have a majority of voters in the state who are fired up about that issue. Uh, they were going to vote for a Democrat anyway. Maybe they're a little more motivated. Maybe there are a few more that are going to come out. And that's what obviously what Democrats are counting on. The The question is when and I've heard this from some pollsters that I've talked to in the last couple of weeks that uh, as they're polling undecideds uh, and, and people who are breaking late, uh, abortions may be the third or fourth or fifth issue for them. 
uh, and and crime is maybe the second or third or fourth issue for them. It is it is heavily uh, an economic issue, and and I don't think Darren Bailey's done a particularly good job in pointing out some of the things that uh, that that he could be uh, hitting the governor on, including doubling the gas tax, uh, you know, including the the issues that that are out there, the gimmicks with. Uh, the two cent cut in the gas tax and the uh, what is it one percent grocery tax cut? I went to the grocery store the other day and it it didn't help at all. Uh, so it's it's you know there's uh, there are definitely um, I think there are missed opportunities here um, that that are impacting people uh, on a daily basis. And 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 you're right on on the the crime issue and the safety act and. Um, you know, I think the cash bail issue is one that's very confusing to a lot of people, especially if you've like never covered courts. Um, and, and, you know, back in my reporter days, I've spent plenty of time covering courtrooms. So, you know, I have a decent understanding of, of the the bond system. And, you know, in effect, let, let's just be real here. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm honest, I, I come at things from a center right perspective. Um, you know, I, Ending cash bail isn't that huge of a deal. It's how you implement it. And, you know, the governor's running around, you know, basically pretending as if everything in that law is fine. Uh, Darren Bailey's running around saying everything in that law is the end of days. And and neither are giving you the, the reality of the situation. Uh, you've got a... a a system the the law itself is is convoluted and has some some double speak and and poor wording uh, especially in the role of judges in in the process so um it needs to be cleaned up in that sense uh and and the question is whether the the left flank in the governor's party who he has been very careful not to cross uh is is going to allow clarity in that law to give judges the ability to hold someone uh without without bond without an opportunity you know to get out because they're they're detained until trial i think the great a great example of this and this has been kind of a social media fight in the last 24 hours has been related to this uh, this kid from from the city who who threatened Aaron Bailey's life and his family and and uh, read the transcript. It's terrifying that that somebody could think that about a politician that they agree with or disagree with. Um, you know the the Democrats are saying that you know he's he got a seventy five thousand dollar bond, so he only had to post seventy five hundred and and would be back out on the street and could be a, a threat to somebody. The the Republicans are saying that, you know, he he would be free to go no matter what, which which isn't the case because he's a he he could be clearly defined as a threat to a specific person listed as as Darren Bailey. So so a judge, even as even the way, even with the convoluted way the the law is written now, a judge could say, all right, we believe you're a threat to the Republican nominee for governor in this state. You're being detained until trial. Uh, so that's a long way of saying that that we're not necessarily getting the the straight story from anyone on crime, which I think just adds to the confusion and frustration and um, I think concern that a lot of voters, especially suburban voters, have uh, as as crime continues to tick up and and in cases, you know, move out to the suburbs. Sorry, Ben, any thoughts there? Yeah, I think Patrick summarized it really well. Um, you know, both candidates have been asked about the changes. Um, Darren just maintains that it should be repealed and the Safety Act should be abolished. Um, you know, the governor acknowledges that there should be changes, but he won't say what. So voters aren't going to have that in mind going to the polls. Um, so that's something we're going to iron out in Springfield later this month. You know, I was going to ask this question prior to you talking about this, uh, Patrick, but it's, I wonder, you know, 
voters in the suburbs and uh, certain parts of Chicago and most likely around the state have been receiving uh, either, however you look at either a newspaper or some political ads um, highlighting these issues. Did that add to the confusion? Is this also going to be a big part of what turns people out to vote? I, I think that I, I think the the news itself is is going to um, has already made crime an issue in people's minds. You know, when you turn on the the TV on a Sunday evening, or or open the newspaper, or click on the Tribune's website, or, or does anyone still open a newspaper? Uh, you know, and and you know, you see fourteen people shot on a Saturday night, or or a mass shooting in Washington Park, or uh, the the carjackings in the Loop, and and the 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 issues are clearly on their minds because they're hearing about them day in and day out. And and even if you're not a news consumer, uh, which thankfully everyone who's on on this panel today is a news consumer, thanks. Uh, you know, it's it's a, you know, they're but even if they're not, they're aware of the issue. They're aware that crime is a problem. They have anecdotal evidence. They have, you know, stories. There's there's a barstool sports video of a of a carjacking in the loop one day. So I mean it's it's everywhere. Uh, so it, it's 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 on people's minds now. It, in terms of the the profed fake newspapers, will they do enough to make a difference? I don't know. I, I kind of doubt it. Uh, but you know. And and I I don't know that anybody opens those things up and and says oh this newspaper that I've never heard of and I've never subscribed to is telling me this important information I, I would hope that most voters would look at that with at least an ounce of skepticism uh, especially in the way that uh, the way that they write things in such a salacious partisan. Uh, clearly slanted way and and they're trying to pass it off as journalism which is uh, it's a family show so i won't say the bad word but it's bs <laughs> you know anecdotally it it brought the conversation to um people who typically wouldn't have discourse with me about policy and politics um but i don't think it's going to turn those those individuals that um you know brought up the conversation with me to the polls so um we'll take it as it is but i, I we do need to to jump to uh, our next topic. But before I do, I know Chris um, Devine has a um, interesting question here about Biden and Harris coming to stump um, in Illinois this weekend. Um, does this have any implications as to maybe these races are closer than we think? That was my immediate uh, reaction when I when I saw the news come through that they were both um, coming over the coming days. But um, I don't know if it's just for the governor that they're coming in or maybe some down, uh, down ballot races. So as we proceed through here, um, let's keep that question in mind when we talk about these these other races. But if there's anything to make comment about for the governor's race, um, we'll get some quick final thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, and I'll just say on 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 the president and the vice president, I assume they don't get out of the Chicago media market because th they probably hurt Democrats if they go downstate. Right. Uh, the these are significantly uh, more targeted, especially the president's visit on Friday is going to be specifically targeted suburban congressional races that are complete toss ups. Uh, the 6th and the 14th have, depending on whatever rating ratings agency you look at, has 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 made it a coin flip. The 11th is is in play. There are people who think the 8th is in play. So so these are these are congressional seat visits that that will also say nice things about the governor. Ben, similar thoughts there? Yeah, same thing. Um, the vice president will be on the south side of Washington Park on Sunday with the governor. Um, it's hard to say if that really means that they feel like it's a closer election. Um, you know, it's a friendly crowd, that's for sure. Um, it shows Democratic enthusiasm, so that can translate nationally as well, just with a national TV audience, you know, seeing the vice president here. So we'll see. Well, we'll move on to the secretary of state's race. Um, you know, we obviously have some pretty familiar faces um, from certainly two of the candidates, uh, Alexi Janulius, Dan Brady, John Stewart. 
Um, you know, the first time in a quarter century that we're going to have a new Secretary of State. How close is this race, Ben? It's hard to say. Um, you know, there's less name recognition with these two candidates than there is in the governor's race. Um, so I think, you know, it, it generally is going to lean towards the Democrats because that's how the state of Illinois is. That's where people are voting for governor that trickles down the ballot. Um, the difference here is that Dan Brady has good name recognition because he's been around a long time and he's got you know other family members who've been involved at a statewide level in politics as well. So people recognize his name and Dan Brady is also not this right wing candidate like Darren Bailey. Um, Dan Brady's pretty moderate. A lot of people like him. He's popular in the General Assembly. Um, so a lot of this it's. In some ways, it's hard to gauge where this race is going to go just because, you know, it's two new candidates. It's not Jesse White on the ballot. Maybe voters do want to change and want a party change. Um, and I think some of it will depend on what kind of message they're hearing. And they're hearing a lot from Alexei Janulius. They're not hearing a lot from Dan Brady. He's not on TV. Um, but you see Alexei on TV a lot talking about ice cream with kids, playing basketball in the gym. Um, but at the end of the day, I think both candidates have kind of similar visions for the office um, and each of them kind of chalks it up to different experiences as to why they're more qualified. You know, I, I think when we talk about Alexi Janulius and name recognition, I think we need to remember the fact he hasn't been on a ballot in this state uh, in 12 years. Um, you know, Ben may still have been in grade school at that point. Um, it, it's, <laughs> it's um, you know, I, so so it's not like, I mean, we're freaks that that we pay attention to these things and know who these guys are and know what their history is. We are the exception to the electorate. Um, you know, I had a I was at a, a doctor's appointment before the primary when um, the the doctor who knows I work in the political world said, you know, I really like that Brady. I, I voted for him when he ran for governor, and and you know, so they he doesn't know that you know that's a regular voter who doesn't know that uh, that. Dan Brady and Bill Brady are two different people and uh, aren't even related. Uh, they just happen to have the same last name uh, and live in the same town. Uh, so, you know, I, I don't know if that helps or hurts, Dan. Um, you're right that the the money issue has has been a gigantic chasm in this race. Uh, you know, Dan's never been a, a prolific fundraiser anyway, uh, and it's shown, um, you know, he he was able to get on on cable in the primary, but uh, you know hasn't been able to do anything like that in in the general, and and that that will probably end up costing him, and he knows that. Uh, I think he's. I think we need to remember though, uh, Brady is one of the best retail politicians in the state. Uh, he is a, an incredibly likable guy, and and as he you know hits a train station, hits a. Um, you know, a diner or whatever in, in these final few days, he's going to change a few minds. I, I don't I don't know that that he can shake enough hands to overcome the deficit, but um, I think he's also counting on potential ticket splitting. Um, I think we see, especially with educated voters in the suburbs, uh, you're you're getting more ticket splitting than maybe you would have in the past. And uh, there could be people who see that as a check uh, balance on on what would be a Democratic governor. Uh, you know, if you go through and you vote Democrat for governor, Democrat for U.S. Senate, Democrat for Congress. All right, well, I'm going to I'm going to mix this up and and, you know, vote for a little check in the uh, in the uh, secretary of state's office. And I and I don't know that that anyone remembers the Janulius ethics issues. I mean, the 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 Jaws Durango and the bad loans at the bank and and of course the eighty million dollars in losses in in uh, uh, the College of Illinois. It's it, it, so it's um, you know it, it those issues are there and I mean we know that they worked because Mark Kirk essentially won a Senate race hit, hitting him on uh, the Durango stuff. So it. it the the issue, though, you know, Republicans just haven't been able to make any hay and and the media has seemingly not covered this race at all. You know, Alexi didn't have uh, the endorsements of the uh, major party players in the primary. Um, 
how have we seen the party coalesce behind him? Um, any any thoughts there, Ben? Yeah, the party's completely gotten behind him. Um, Jesse White and Doris Dana Valencia in the primary, um, but very quickly and easily jumped behind Alexei in this election. Um, one of the endorsements I think is interesting to note is that I think it was the Illinois Education Association. They endorsed all Democrats, um, you know, it's typical of a union, but they did endorse Dan Brady. Um, they said they really enjoyed working with him. They found him to be an easy lawmaker to work with throughout the last 20 years in the House. Um, so they felt he was a better choice, despite, you know, Janulius has lots and lots of money and endorsements from other unions. Um, so it's kind of, I guess, an interesting endorsement in the race that kind of shows, you know, there's, um, you know, a lot to be evaluated based on what these people or what these candidates can actually do for people going to the DMV. Because at the end of the day, the one thing everybody just wants from the Secretary of State to be able to get their driver's license and anything else from the Secretary of State's office easily and quickly. Um, indeed, indeed. And, and that's the thing to remember, though, is that the Secretary of State in Illinois, uh, unlike what you're hearing about Secretary of State in many other states, is is there's no election role here. There's no election administrative role. Um, so it's not like the uh, who's the guy in Arizona, Mark Fincham, who who said that he would essentially throw out the 2020 election. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it, it, there's no role there, you know, in in terms of of election administration. So so we're we're uh, essentially electing an administrator here who who runs driver's license facilities and, you know, business filing offices and it's it's a you know it's a it's a patronage gig but but it's not one that outside of dmv you know i don't know that that people pay close attention to secretary of state you know other than how much am i paying for my license plate this year all right moving on to the illinois supreme court uh races I'm going to let you guys really dig into this, but I think there's some pretty important implications of what happens between these two races. Um, you know, Ben, why don't you, you know, dig down into what what those implications are? Yeah, the real implication at the end of the day is the balance of the court. So currently we have a 4-3 Democrat majority Supreme Court, um, which Justice Michael Burke from DuPage County is currently on. Um, but if both Burke and Mark Hearn, who's the former sheriff of Lake County and was the 2020 Republican nominee for Senate to challenge Dick Durbin, um, if they both win, this court shifts to a 4-3 Republican balance. And that's why you've seen abortion be the number one issue in this race, um, which Patrick can certainly talk a little bit more about that specifically in the advertising we've seen around there. Um, but at the end of the day, really what needs to happen here is Democrats just need to win one of these seats to be able to retain the 4-3 majority and keep their keep their majority on the court. Um, it's really hard to say which one of those it will be. It seems just my sense is that it's more likely to be the second district in Lake McHenry, Kane County. Um, you know, Mark Hearn is he was rated not qualified by the Bar Association because he's a sheriff. He's not he's not a judge. Um, Elizabeth Rochford has been a Lake County judge for a very long time. Um, so it seems like that one is probably more likely to lean Democrat. Um, but really, it's it's really hard to tell who could win either of these races. Um, yeah, Patrick, if you want to talk a little bit here about the abortion issue and these commercials that we've seen, that would be great. Well, and, and one thing, you know, just when you mentioned the second district, Rochford, while she's been a, an associate judge in Lake County for for all these years, uh, she's never handled a felony trial. She's never handled a, a, a major case. She, I think, she's done family law almost the entire time. Uh, so, so it's it's not like she's uh, been handling these major cases, which you can say Mary Kay O'Brien has done in, in the appellate court for almost 20 years. Yeah, the the advertising thing and I and this I, I've kind of raised raised a little bit of a stink over the way that uh, the left has sort of just made up Mike Burke's abortion position, uh, which he has never stated publicly. Uh, they they when they put out their first TV ad that that said, you know, Michael Burke said, I think they actually they actually stated in the ad, Michael Burke says the Supreme Court did the right thing. 
said, okay, where did he say that? Because I haven't seen that. Uh, so they sent me a clip of an interview he did on like a public access thing where, where again, you go through and you listen to every word he says. He did not say that. Uh, he said something about, um, you know, how the, the issue was not an enumerated right, which it isn't. I mean, that's fact. So, so that's what they used as their basis of of saying what Mike Burke's abortion position was, and 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 the tradition. And I've worked some judicial races in the past. I mean, you're not judges aren't allowed to have positions, political positions like this, uh, and and so so it's incredibly inappropriate for for one O'Brien to to make up Burke's position on this. Two. Uh, to run around, both of them have been running around touting their their pro choiceiness their personal PAC endorsements, their Planned Parenthood endorsements, which is, I think, skirting that line. Uh, my guess is that there are probably going to be some uh, some ethics issues and and complaints filed with the Attorneys Disciplinary Commission and the Judicial Inquiry Board because of it. Uh, you know, just because of of how. Uh, you know, Curran has been a politician, so he's made abortion statements. Burke has never done that. Burke's never ruled on an abortion case. He's never been involved in an abortion case. So, so there is no true record anywhere of Mike Burke on abortion. So how how can we say that, and how can we get away with that? It's just it's been a really frustrating um, uh, situation to to watch. Uh, one side, you know, and, and the other side's been doing it too in other races, but specifically in, in this race, you know, the, the left is essentially making up positions that they think is going to work for them and, and hoping to capitalize on it. And any final thoughts on this race? Yeah, I think Patrick summed it up there nicely. Um, just the other thing I would note is, you know, there's varying political action committees and other independent expenditure groups really involved in this race. On the on the right, you have Citizens for Judicial Fairness. That's Ken Griffin's group. He put a lot of money into it way back earlier this year, and they're spending money attacking the Democrats in this race. And on the right or on the left, there's this new committee called All for Justice. It's backed by the unions, by Democrats. Um, Don Harmon's one of his top attorneys is the one running this committee, they're spending a bunch of money attacking the Republicans. So there's a lot of money going into this. Um, it's the most in the country, most expensive race in the country this year. Um, so that's why it's, you're it's, seeing it nonstop on TV. It's also worth mentioning, though, that All for Justice Committee has raised its money late. Uh, so they weren't able to make their TV buys early like Judicial Fairness did or or the campaigns did. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and an outside pack uh, like this can get can get pushed off of broadcast TV. So uh, the judicial fairness group or uh, the all for justice group, the Harmon guy, uh, they, they're they not on broadcast TV in Chicago for the last week uh, since they've raised all their money late and weren't able to, to, to make a buy on many Chicago broadcast stations. Which race is that gonna impact the most, do you think, Patrick? I, I think, so, so I would say the third probably leans a little more Republican, especially as, uh, especially if the numbers look more like 14 than 18 in a in DuPage County. Of course, you've got a, a million people there compared to uh, Will County's there too, so that's 700,000. So, so those two counties are obviously the the biggies in that district, including uh, my home county, uh, Iroquois County, which has all of like 27,000 people. So, you know, they're just kind of also rands in that district. Um, the uh, so, you know, I think I think that um, the second probably leans a little more Democratic. Um, I, I think it will be interesting to see how turnout is uh, one in Lake County. Uh, I think Highland Park could be a, a big push uh, on on guns in uh, among Lake County voters, specifically, you know, liberal voters and. And McHenry County is in that that district as well too, and it's it's one that has been solidly conservative over you know the last decade and growing. 
So, so what kind of turnout do you see there? So I think we're going to have potentially two very close Supreme Court races. And, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm flipping coins today, I would say Republicans win the third and Democrats win the second. But uh, I, I don't know that I'm, I, I, I'm not flipping coins. <laughs> All right. Moving on to the um, attorney general race here. Hold on. When you, Peter Scozzi's in with a quick question. When you get to legislative races, love your opinion on Patrick Joyce's race and recent advice. All right, Pat, um, Peter, just a couple of more races before that. But um, the attorney general, we have uh, Kwame Raoul and Tom DeVore. Uh you know, I think we all kind of see where this race is going, but um, the the question that I that kind of comes to my mind is is how does DeVore's celebrity status from the COVID lawsuit translate into votes? Um, Patrick Ben, whoever would like to take that, feel free. It doesn't. He's going to lose. <laughs> Next. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I don't I. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, you know, the last time I pulled the question, the governor had a 60 percent approval rating on his COVID handling, you know, on his handling of the COVID situation. You know, DeVore is reaching a very specific set of the population with his uh, his his anti mask, anti vaccine, anti uh, executive order stuff. Uh, and, and that's just not going to play, uh, especially in the suburbs. So I, I, I don't I mean, it may mirror the Bailey race a little bit. He may even do a little bit better than Bailey. Uh, but but I don't think it's I don't think it's a race that's going to end up within five points by any means. Yeah, I think it's like the rest of the the ticket on the statewide, you know, a lot at the top with the governor's race dictates what happens down the ballot in some of these other races. Um, you know, just looking at records here, Tom DeVore has talked a lot about crime, just like Bailey, he has run a campaign almost entirely devoted to the Safety Act and issues and changes he sees with it. Um, Kwame Rebel has got a record of his own on crime as well. Um, you know, whether you feel like the status of crime in Illinois and in Chicago is where it should be, that's that's another question. But um, the attorney general has passed legislation in the last year that has tried to crack down on carjackings, re- deal with organized retail crime, um, ban ghost guns. So he's done things that I think people, especially in the Chicago area, want to see who are concerned about crime. Um, and it feels like that message is also going to outweigh probably whatever divorcing about the Safety Act, um, especially you know when you hear DeVore talk about the Safety Act. It's often very complicated how he talks about it. He talks about it very much from an attorney point, lots of legal jargon. Um, I think that might make it hard for people to understand exactly the arguments he's making. All right. Uh, let's move on to the uh, workers' right amendment. Um, ben, why don't you just kind of summarize quickly what, what this amendment's all about? Sure, this amendment is it's essentially a ban on right to work. So we've seen other states around the country move to these right to work laws. Illinois is not planning to do that. It's not going to happen anytime soon, but this is Democrats reaction to, you know, fears, I guess, that this could happen here in Illinois. They don't want to see, um, you know, unions lose their ability to bargain. So what this amendment does, it enshrines bargaining rights into the state constitution. It's would be the strongest union rights in the country if this is enacted. Um, gives them power to negotiate over wages, hours, other things that also include economic welfare. And in another part of the amendment, it says something like, and other terms and conditions. So that's kind of where the opposition had to this has gotten like, okay, what are those other things? What does economic welfare mean? Because like in 2019, the Chicago Teachers Union tried to bargain over like rental prices and housing in in Chicago that are completely outside the classroom. So the opposition feels like this basically opens up a can of worms to allowing unions to bargain over whatever they want to bargain over. Um, People supporting this say this is really just a measure that's going to shore up the ability to make sure that people in unions are able to bargain over what they need to do their job. That's why you've seen a lot of ads focusing on firefighters, nurses, people, the public, people in unions that the public respects and likes. Um, It feels like it's gonna pass, but constitutional amendments are very, almost difficult to gauge because they can reach beyond 50% of the vote, but depending on whether it was 50% of everybody who voted in the election or 
60% of the people vote on the question. I might even have that backwards. Um, but, you know, it's it's kind of an interesting question. I think um, a lot of people probably aren't aware of it going into the ballot box. They may skip over it altogether because it takes up a lot of space on the left side of it. Um, but ultimately, it's a big, it'd be a huge victory for unions for sure if this were to pass. I think it's it's I think it's most important to note that um, this will have no impact on private sector unions. None. Those are those are all governed by federal law, uh, National Labor Relations Board, and and the the federal laws that that uh, impact that, and and it's been a slightly disingenuous for supporters to. Uh, to run around and and use private sector workers as their basis for for the ad when they're already or for their advertising when they're already covered by uh, by federal law uh, that has been long standing. I mean, you know, Democrats and and supporters will tell you, well, we thought Roe wasn't going anywhere. Well, that was a Supreme Court case, not a, a federal law that's been in in statute for decades. Um, the the opposition, uh, you know, the Illinois Policy Institute folks will tell you that uh, this gives unrestricted um, power to public sector unions. Uh, and that's where they come up with their property tax increase line that that uh, it's going to cost more for uh, public sector employees, which is going to to make cities and school boards and et cetera, et cetera, raise their taxes to pay for uh, things that they can't afford. Um, I, in, in the end, I'm, I'm, I'm a little, I, I'm confused at the need in terms of, of uh, private sector union members um, or, or, you know, take the Amazon and Starbucks employees that are, uh, in the news lately, you know, when they say we want to form a union or or when they do form a union, those things are all covered in federal law. So so why is there a need for for a state constitutional amendment uh, here? And and, you know, we should we should remember that changing the Constitution is and should be a big deal. And and is it is it completely necessary? Is it completely uh is it is it the right thing to do? And that I mean, that's why we have that threshold, which is, you know, 60 percent of I think you did get it right, Ben, 60 percent of people who vote on the question or 50 percent of people or 50 percent plus one of people who uh, vote in the entire election. So if there are a million people who vote on the question, it needs, you know, 60 percent there. If there are a million people who vote in the election, uh, you need. 500,000 one yes votes even if they passed up the um the question on on when they when they went through that's essentially a no vote uh so so it's a high threshold uh and and you saw that you know I don't think voters are always um super eager to to amend the constitution I mean there was I, I think a lot of people thought that the graduated income tax thing two years ago would, would sail uh, because it's a, a blue state, a presidential year, a uh, the governor put a bunch of money into it and and it it got creamed. So I, I don't I I I hate to say things are toss ups because I'm it, it seems like I'm sure. uh, I'm I'm punting, but I, I honestly don't know how this will turn out. Well, what does it mean if it doesn't? If it doesn't meet those thresholds or or loses altogether, like um, the previous amendment, we're already a, we're already right. a heavily union state. I mean, it's a it's a heavily union support supportive state. Federal law will continue to to run like it does when you know when those Amazon workers or those those Starbucks workers want to form a union. So, uh, in in essence, it it just continues to um continues to move with the status quo status quo have we seen any significant dollars come out in opposition 
to this? And and if so, where where are those funders coming from, or who are those major funders? Yeah. So Dick Uline put was it two yeah. million Ben into the um, at least I think institutes? he may have even given more recently. Yeah. So so I so Dick Uline of course has been you know the one who's essentially writing the checks for Republicans that he supports this um, this cycle and and he uh, he made he made a big cash in influx but you know they're not they're not running TV ads uh, you know they're so I I'm not necessarily sure exactly what they're doing but. Uh, you know, it's it's been, um, you know, they're they're dwarfed in money by by the unions and, and folks that are putting money into the the yes side. Uh, but that side was also had a bunch of money two years ago. So I don't know that money is necessarily the, the factor here. Any last thoughts on this topic before we head over to the to Senate side of things? All right. All right. So. <clears throat> You know we have uh, we've got three uh, three districts highlighted here. Um, earlier conversations, I think we're going to just drop it down to the 48th and the 56th, and maybe touch on a couple of other ones. So let's just get right into it. Um, you know, Curdy, current party control has Democrats at 41, Republicans at 18. What are we seeing out there, Ben? Yeah, the reason these three are on here, these are the ones that. Dan McConkie's Senate Republican Victory Fund have put money into, but the ones um, that are clearly the most competitive are the 48th and 56th. So the 48th is currently Doris Turner's down in Springfield, um, former Springfield Alderwoman. Um, this district goes over to uh, Decatur. It was drawn to bring in, you know, as many Democrats as it possibly can into it, um, but it's still a complete toss up. And Sandy Hamilton is a new state representative who's running in this seat. This race has gotten really nasty and if you live in the springfield market you're probably getting blown away by the ads on tv with accusations on both sides um doris turner brings a lot of baggage into this race um her husband was arrested on corruption charges there's other things in her background that um have really come up in a lot of these negative ads that republicans are running against her um it's really hard to say where this race is going to go. It's clearly a complete toss up. Um, there's even been some private polls that have shown this as well. And then over in the 56th in the Metro East, uh, Chris Tharp is the incumbent senator Senator there. He took over for Rochelle Crow earlier in the summer when she was appointed U.S. attorney down in Southern Illinois. So he has no experience. He has nothing to run on. He just happens to be the incumbent. And Republicans see this as another opportunity to um, pick up a seat here and you know, they can use every seat they they uh, can get. Um, that's really the end goal here is to try and bring down the Democrats supermajority as much as they can. Yeah, so the, um, you know, one thing just real quickly on the 36, since you mentioned it, I think Republicans were excited about this race early. Mike Tomes is the mayor of Rock Island, uh, but they've they've pulled their money off of TV uh, in the last couple of weeks. So uh, I, I don't. I, it's not to say Tomes can't win that race, uh, but but it's it's less likely. The 48th is one of the meanest, uh, nastiest legislative races we've seen in some time. Um, the Democrats redo the, redrew this district because if you remember 10 years ago, essentially it was drawn for Andy Menard. Um, so it, it went from McCoupin County where he lives um, you know, up to Springfield and over to Decatur, as as a traditional Democrat would do less well in in a uh, in McCoupin County. Normally, uh, they kind of cut the southern half of that district out and then made it a little more urban, uh, kind of a, a Springfield to Decatur dumbbell a little bit. Um, you know, Turner. You know, Ben's right. There's a lot of baggage there. Uh, the the ads that are running against her look look terrible, um, you know, and and they're kind of running. Democrats are kind of running the uh, normal playbook um, against Hamilton, who uh, has been you know in the community for for decades. She was the volleyball coach at Sacred Heart Griffin. She's in real estate, so so she's somebody who's who's known in the community anyway. Um, so we'll see how that translates politically. Uh, one of the interesting things in the primary, uh, that was one of the few districts where 
there were more Republican votes cast in the primary than there were Democratic votes. So, you know, I think that there's a, a sense that uh, that that one may have a little more Republican momentum. And, and in the 56th, Republicans love their candidate, uh, Erica Harris, who is uh, she's she's telegenic. She's she's smart. She's well spoken. Uh, they're actually running St. Louis broadcast TV ads for her, which uh, outside of Darren Bailey, maybe the only Republican in the state who's on broadcast TV right now. Um, I guess Hamilton is too, but uh, you know, it's but in a market the size of St. Louis, um, it, it's it's huge. And um, you know, Tharp is uh, a Madison County, a former Madison County uh, sheriff's deputy, uh, who's who's literally never served a day in Springfield. Um, it, it's, it's so, so, you know, incumbent is, you know, kind of, you know, with a little asterisk next to it. Um, and, and they're running a, a pretty, um, I don't think either campaign knows exactly what to do in that district because it is trending so much more Republican over the years, uh, over the recent years. And, you know, I think, Everybody expects Darren Bailey to do better in Madison and St. Clair than, you know, in in DuPage and Lake and Kendall. So so I think you're you're kind of seeing some message differences there based on uh, how how well uh, things are going for either party uh, down in the corner. But if if Democrats hang on to that one, it may be by a thread. You're on mute, Don. Sorry, those kids were uh, being a little loud downstairs, so sorry about that. Uh, I, I, before we move on, I want to just uh, acknowledge Peter's um, question around Patrick Joyce's race and, against uh, Philip Nagel. Um, a number of recent ad buys happening there. Any thoughts on on that race? I don't know, man. I, I, I you know, Peter's asked me this question too, so I, I still <laughs> don't have an answer. Um, it, it's, it, it is a, it, it's a district that, um, you know, the Kankakee half of it, um, is probably a little more Republican. Uh, that's the, the side that Jackie Haas has, uh, even though on paper, her district is, is pretty close. Uh, the other half is kind of that far South suburban, it's Anthony DeLuca's district. Uh, and there must be polling out there that, that's showing Joyce as weak. Uh, that would be the only explanation that that would explain them putting that much money into broadcast TV for uh, a Kankakee area Senate race. So I I, I don't I mean, Republicans have Republic. I don't have it in front of me, but it's it's significant. I mean, it's um, was it a couple of hundred thousand over the last couple of weeks? But um, so so he's. Uh, I think there's a trend in that area that that has Democrats concerned because I think there's concern even over DeLuca at this point. But Republicans have done nothing for for Nagel, you know, and he's done nothing. He's raised no money. He has I didn't even know his name until like two weeks ago. Um, so if maybe this is one of those things where they just have more money than they know what to do with and they're just being careful. But I, I don't have I don't have a good answer. Ben, anything, anything there? Okay, very good. Well, <clears throat> any other Senate races you guys want to touch on before we move on to the House of Representatives? Real quick, the uh, the race with uh, Michael Hastings, of course. I think everyone's probably aware that he's got a lot of problems to deal with right now in his first personal and professional life. Um, he's accused by Springfield lobbyists of being a bully in meetings and whatnot. Um, now he's got this really, really nasty divorce with allegations of domestic violence that have come out. Um, it was just in the news the other day, WBZ obtained a bunch of the police records on it. Um, you know, it even, you know, Don Harmon's not directly campaigning for him. Governor Pritzker has flat out asked him to resign. Um, you know, it seems like this is a good opportunity for Republicans to pick up a seat there as well. Um, Patrick Sheehan, he's a Plainfield police officer. He's the Republican running against Hastings there. 
Yeah, and, and Republicans have been able to, to scrape up enough money to get on cable there. Uh, and I don't know if you've seen the ad, Ben. It is. It is mean. Whoo! Uh, it, it's it's. But I mean, it's it, you have to admit, though, it's fair game. I mean, it's mm-hmm. you know, this this stuff is I mean, part of it even included taxpayer dollars, uh, you know, in in the, the settlement with the former employee. So so it's it's obviously a. Uh, an issue there. And so I think, I think Republicans feel really good about that race, uh, just specifically because of the train wreck that Hastings has been in the last, uh, in the last few months and the, the way that he's acted toward people there, there have been, um, letters that the Hastings campaign sent out that were meant to look like they came from his ex-wife, uh, but were actually, I guess, supposedly from his sister, um, it it doesn't look that way when you read it, especially because his sister doesn't go by Kate. Um, so <laughs> it's and, and isn't a Hastings anymore. Uh, it, it, it you know, and I think it, even the I mean, the social media post that is his now ex-wife uh, put out about it has has kind of blown up in that area. And, and it just it just looks so bad. And um, <clears throat> this is one where I think Democrats feel like. Uh, they may take it on the chin this year, and then uh, in two years they'll they'll find themselves a more suitable candidate and go win that race. Blowing fruit. All right. Um, let's jump over to the House end of things. Um, we've got seven uh, races here. We're running out of time, so maybe we can push through these quickly and then do some final thoughts. Um, if any of you out there have any questions, now's a good time to hit that chat box, throw your questions in there so that we can uh, make sure that we uh, address any other um, uh, topics that you guys want to discuss. So, um, Ben, Patrick, you know, if you guys want to divvy these up or just go ahead and attack each one, feel free. Yeah, I'll I'll take it from a kind of a, a broad perspective here. Um, basically, know that the number that's really important here is Democrats have 73 people in the house right now so if they get down below 70 they lose their super majority um, that they've had for the last two years and republicans see a really good chance they have over at least back in the summer it was over 100 people were running for seats throughout the state um, most of them are going to lose there's i mean there's really no chance that the republicans actually take a majority in the house here but um, what they're really trying to do is get rid of that super majority and they really only need to take down three incumbents, but they also need to maintain all the seats of new people who are cycling through in their party, like Mark Batnick's seat. They got to keep that even though he's not running. Um, I guess looking at this list here are these four. Um, the one I'll highlight is 51st House District between Chris Boss and Nabila Syed. Um, Nabila is, she's 23 years old. She's you know, very new to politics, obviously. Her background is in political advocacy and other things like that. Um, Chris Boss is freshman representative, and it's pretty, it's a moderate district. It doesn't want a far right person, it doesn't want a far left person up there in uh, Southern Lake County, Northwest Cook County. Um, Nabila's put a lot of effort into this. She knocks a ton of doors. I think she might knock more than just about anybody in the party. Um, She's got ads on TV as well, but Chris Boss is, you know, he's more moderate. He's got a C rating from the NRA, so they can't really knock him on the guns. He is pro-life, so they're getting, the Democrats are getting him there. Um, But I think that's just one of the more interesting races to watch to see, you know, if Democrats can actually take a seat away from Republicans. Yeah, I think a ton of these DuPage County seats, like the the Yang Roar, you know, Yang Roar two years ago beat um, Grant Whaley in, uh, in, in that Naperville area district, um, Costa Howard, you know, has only been around for a couple of years. I think it goes back to keep an eye on DuPage County that I, I talked about half an hour ago. That uh, if if you're seeing trending, you know, races trending more Republican at the top of the ticket, uh, then that probably means bad things for uh, some of the Democratic uh, candidates in in DuPage County. Uh, what I'll what I'll mention though is that you know we've talked about money a lot, but uh, House Republicans have none of it. Um, you know, Uline wrote has written checks to to Dan McConkey and Senate Republicans, uh, but but have not written has not given a, a dollar to to Durkin. Um, so they I think they have um, 
they've just made their first broadcast buys in the last couple of weeks. Uh, at one point, it was like 14 Democratic candidates were on broadcast TV and zero Republicans were. Uh, you're, you're right about the 51st district race. That's a lot of new territory for Chris Boss. Um, my anecdotally, my in-laws live in that district, uh, and uh, Syed knocked on their door, and my my center right-ish father-in-law uh, was incredibly impressed by her, mm -hmm. and and when he actually saw what she supports and sees that she's, you know, pretty pretty far left. He's like, wow, I, I had no idea. So it's, it's a, uh, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see if she's knocked on enough doors to make a difference there. Uh, the 48th, I think one thing we need to keep an eye on is, uh, uh, San Elitro was at the January 6th rally. Um, and, and I know the Democrats have been mentioning that in, in mail and things like that. So, so we'll see what kind of Trump pushback there is there. Um, the, 66th district, the one that Suzanne Ness won two years ago, uh, she essentially won a Republican district because the Republican quit. Uh, Alan Skillicorn would refused to step off the ballot because they were going to uh, likely put a a moderate on the on the ballot. Um, Carolyn Schofield, who ended up being on the ticket for lieutenant governor uh, earlier this year. Um, that's so, but they gave Ness a little bit better of a district, though uh, a lot of McHenry County uh, in that in that district. So it could it could flip. Uh, the Keith Wheeler's in a, a fight for his life. Uh, that that's maybe a D plus nine district. I think I don't have it in front of me, but uh, union ton of union money, ton of Democratic money in for Matt Hansen, who uh, worked for the railroad, I believe, and then that Bloomington Peoria. Uh, district. Uh, Scott Preston is on the Normal City Count or Normal Town Council. Uh, Sharon Chung is on the Mac uh, McLean County Board. Uh, she's she's a little more liberal than you would expect to see in a McLean County district. So uh, that's one of those maybe stretch districts for Democrats where they uh, kind of hooked uh, Dave Kaler's Senate district half of it into into Bloomington, trying to to pick one off. But uh, I think that's going to be. Uh, I think that's going to be an interesting one to to watch too. Well, I know we're we're just elapsing the uh, end of the hour. Um, <clears throat> we didn't get to um, any U.S. Rate, uh, congressional races. Any thoughts there, quickly, guys? It could be wild. Um, it, it's uh, <laughs> it's going to be wild. I think there there are three races that have been moved into toss ups from either Real Clear Politics or Cook in the last couple of weeks in the um, uh, 14th, which is Lauren Underwood's district, uh, the 6th, which is um, Sean Caston's district, uh, and the 13th was already a toss-up in, in most races. The 17th uh, may go Republican. There are people, I have people who think that the 11th may flip, uh, even though I think that's maybe a bigger stretch. Uh, it's some of these races are going to be way closer than than Democrats thought they would be. Ben, any any final thoughts there? Yeah, I think that's just why you're hearing that, you know, there's a rumor that President Biden is going to come here tomorrow, um, possibly yeah. campaign for some of these Democrat congressional candidates. Um, you know, White House hasn't confirmed exactly yet that he's coming or sent us anything. Um, but, you know, it's I think it shows that even the race for Congress could come straight through blue Illinois, um, especially that district in the 17th complete. That's the definition of a toss up district out in Western Illinois there. Um, so definitely worth watching too. And that could give you a barometer of what kind of a night it is on the national scene too, that, that if you're seeing races congressionally flip, if you, if you see Underwood go down, if you see casting go down, and definitely, if you see Foster go down, uh, you're going to see a gigantic night nationally, uh, and and Republicans will will easily take the House. All right, I think we'll we'll leave it there. Uh, Patrick Finkson of the Illinois. Um, I put a link into um, our chat window for you to subscribe to his newsletter. Patrick, I, you seem to have a lot of fans on this uh, on this call already, but why don't you just give a quick shout out about what you what you're covering there? 
Yeah, thank you. We write a daily newsletter. Uh, we have uh, free stuff and paid subscribers. So I uh, would, would love to have you uh, uh, join us, uh, theillinois.com. Uh, we'll we'll um, keep doing uh uh, keep doing plenty on the election, and we'll have a, a live blog Tuesday night, which uh, uh, my friend Ben Garberick will actually handle because I'm going to be on TV. So uh, it, it'll be uh, uh, it'll be a fun couple of days as we keep uh, counting things down. Well, Ben Patrick, thanks again for being on the call. Uh, good luck on WGN um, on Tuesday, Patrick, and we uh, will look forward to the results. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, appreciate you all joining us today for uh, the Daily Lines Press Box. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye bye.